the nature of Lyndon Johnson's campaign was sort of twofold. First of all, he, he was not a, a showboat person like Trump, but Johnson knew how to try to get his way. So he's he would work with his he would work his spell on visiting television and executives and newspaper publishers, of which many were invited to the White House. If you ever see the list of which I've seen the list of his daily diaries, which are available on the internet. Each week he must have had 15 or 20 publishers or television executives at the White House. What was he telling them? Certainly up to 1968, what was he telling them? You can't trust the AP. That Australian guy, Peter Arnett, he went to his death believing I was an Australian, but to him it was the same place, Australia, New Zealand, it's the bottom of the Pacific, right? He's a Texan, you know, that, but, but, but I didn't mind that. But that guy is a communist or sounds like a communist. Then Bill Moyers, who I later got to know and is a wonderful guy, authored a couple of very nasty memos that was circulated among senior government people about Morley Safer and I, claiming that uh, that we were non-Americans. He was from Canada and I was from New Zealand and our patriotism, you know, did not exist and our loyalty was suspect. And which angered me because New Zealand had a fighting force in Vietnam and they took casualties too. But that's just by the way. And and so and so and the other the other weapon that Johnson used was to build up a an information force in Saigon that outnumbered the press five to one. And they sent a press czar, Barry Zorthian, a very amiable, dangerous guy, who worked his will by playing poker with journalists and winning money from them and basically blackmailing them. I'm joking about that. But he made a point of getting to know journalists and his former military uh, marine commander and a very genial fellow, but he hated me. And the reason he hated me was that when I did my analyses, I just didn't do the, the, the action reporting, but the AP required me three or four times a year to do analyses where I'd go to see people like John Paul Van and G General Wyand, who was the commander of the 25th Division and later an important official. I would see him, I was very close to him and comparing notes and I'd write these analyses and Zorthian would call up and call me in and say, Peter, you've done an, another analysis, negative, but you don't include any word of, from, the, from the command. You can't write an analysis of this war and not include my people's comments in it. And I said, yes, I can. Barry, because the Associated Press, it, you know, I'm not from the from the uh, L.A. Times with one reporter here. I'm from the Associated Press. We have reporters here who go to your daily briefings, who go to your background briefings, who travel with Westmoreland on trips and write these glowing stories from their point of view. There's room on the AP for my reports that reflect the views of those I know in the war. My, I don't need to have your comments in my stories. But he had a point because, you know, people would read it and say, well, gee, look at this. This is what's really going on. <laughs> but it, but any, but that was, but that's just by the, when I say we, we didn't get along, we did get along in the sense that he understood the game. And uh, I never felt threatened in all the time I was in Vietnam or any American war that, that I could ever be targeted by assault or, or assassination. It didn't even occur to me. That's why when I stayed in Baghdad years later, I kept telling my people, you know, they're not going to bomb the Al Rashid. May accidentally uh, something may come of it. The, the Americans don't kill journalists. Well, we're going to get... I still believe that. I still believe that. But anyway, that was... So Johnson... So Gallagher was very supportive, and he kept hearing from publishers. They would visit the AP. The AP had you know, 1,900 newspapers supporting in the United States, and they'd come to visit him and say, and on this particular day, they, a couple came in and had visited Johnson the previous day, and they said, that Johnson was really attacking Peter Arnett. 
calling them all sorts of names. So Gallagher, Gallagher called up the White House and said that, uh, I guess killed Bill Moyes and said, I really, it's about time I got to, to meet with the president, you know, to talk about things. And so a couple of days later, he, he visited the White House and Johnson was there and, and they were chatting about things and football or whatever Johnson wanted to talk about. And finally they got to the, and I, what, what was interesting to me because Johnson was the six foot four guy and, uh, you know, aggressive, tough. And Gallagher was six foot four with eyebrows that went from his nose to his ears. T two tough guys looking at each other and both very powerful. Johnson is president and Gallagher, the chief of, you know, what was in the world's preeminent news service. And I can think it still qualifies for that title. So eventually he was, says to the president, Mr. President, I hear you're not happy very happy about AP coverage in Vietnam. And Johnson said, who told you that? I really think you're doing wonderful coverage in Vietnam. Who told you that? So Wes didn't want to get into the argument because he knew what the publisher said. He said, Mr. President, I want you to know something, that the AP covering this war, where neither your policies were neither for you nor against you. And Johnson said, uh, well, Wes, that's not really the way I want it. <laughs> Two years later, three years later, after the Tet Offensive, the, uh, the White House called up Keith Fuller, who was the AP uh, personnel director, and uh, to come and have uh, coffee or something. So, and there's a fellow Texan, so I guess... Johnson had known him or knew him. So Fuller goes there and sitting there and Johnson says, well, you know, you know Keith, we're pulling Barry Zorthian out of Saigon. You know, he's been there all that time. And don't you think it's time to pull that Australian Arnett out of that story? He's been there so long. <laughs> so, you know, Fuller went back to the office, but it was the same kind of thing that Johnson had asked about Halberstam, but it was no way. I mean, that would guarantee my staying in Vietnam for perpetuity. <laughs> but that was the sort of influence. But what you have is not this, you know, this noisy outspokenness that the media is facing today. I mean, it's so embarrassing. And in some sense, it's terrifying, but in another sense, it's ludicrous. But I, you know, I think that the LBJ way was, you know, was really more threatening to the country because he was able to keep the support of the American public up to up to, up to the deaths of twenty five thousand Americans, and the Tet Offensive, you know, turned the country against it. Nixon went in and his policies. Eventually, fifty eight thousand young Americans were killed in Vietnam. And I tell you, for me, being there and being with these young guys and writing about them and getting letters from their families about my stories and saying, you know, thank you for telling us what's happening, or from the soldiers themselves, thank you for being with us at that time. Stor letters like that that I've got, you know, and knowing that I'd be going out again and again and seeing these young people arriving and then the bodies piled up because in many times, you know, I was in areas where 15, 20, 25, 30 Americans had been killed. And it was in so 58,000 Americans dead. So for all that Trump has done, but you know, the problem with Trump, you never quite know if he'll do something that will lead to as many, many deaths of America. That's the frightening aspect of Trump. 